Welcome back, everyone. Charlene de Caesar has been a trusted advisor to executives and organizations around the world for more than two decades. She specializes in helping smart, ambitious sales and business leaders accelerate their growth in a way that's fun, easy, and painless. Charlene is the founder of Firewalk Sales System, a relationship-based sales approach that takes sellers from transactional to transformational and helps sales teams accelerate their growth by focusing on mindset, method, and message. Before developing her own sales consultancy, Charlene was the vice president of sales and marketing at Boardroom Events and led an international sales team at Gardner Inc., where she helped the most respected technology companies in the world extend their brand message. And we're absolutely thrilled to have her here with us today at Boundless. Please welcome Charlene Ignites to Caesar. Charlene, you with us? How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us, Charlene. I'll, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Thank you. So let me go ahead and uh, do I need to do anything on my end? Uh, can we can me? see you. You look great. Yeah, you can okay. kick it off whenever you're ready. Great. So this is great. So um, yeah, I'm so excited to be here because, you know, what I love to share with people is not only how to get more sales, be more successful uh, and make more money, uh, but also to love it, to, to really have, uh, to look forward to every day, to love making those phone calls, to love having those conversations. And so what happens though, is it doesn't always go the way we want it to go. <laughs> so what we're gonna talk about today is first of all, when we talk about the black hole, what does that mean? And then the way that I sort of solve that problem is through three steps that we're gonna talk about, which is mindset, message, and method. And, you know, just to kind of give you a, a sense, you know, I mentioned before that, you know, you wanna love making those calls. Well, the reality is a lot of people don't. A lot of people find growing their business to be very stressful and in particular, the sales process to be very stressful. And what happens, just to give you a little preview into the, the mindset piece of it, what happens is that uh, it puts us into this sort of fight or flight mode where either we just procrastinate, uh, may not make as many phone calls, we may resort to more emailing, for example, uh, or we may just conveniently get too busy to do that follow-up that we know we have to do. Um, or uh, the other thing that can happen is then we, we might say, okay, I'm gonna dig in, I'm gonna do this thing, you know? <laughs> and so we resort to sort of scripts and templates and some of the icky salesy stuff that I think Ryan alluded to earlier. And so what happens though, is when we go into that fight or flight response, guess what? Our, our customers do too, because it's stressful for them. It's stressful for them when, when we approach it, you know, a certain way. And, um, you know, they're going to, we're going to figure all that out together today. So, um, so the first thing is when we think about sort of mindset, um, you know, part of what happens, if you can imagine this, the scenario of having a really good, let's say you meet someone at a networking event and you have a really good conversation with them. And then after the event, you've exchanged business cards. So you send them a LinkedIn invitation and then, you know, they accept your invite, but don't really get too much more response after that. So you might even try to send them a message and say, hey, you know, great meeting you. I'm just following up on the conversation we had. When can we, you know, can we meet for coffee, right? That's a big one. And then still no response. And so you might try to get their email address and figure, well, maybe I'll reach them by email. So you email them and you say, hi, just following up. I, I know you're very busy, you know, could you spare a few minutes? And then it's just like a slippery slope, right? this could happen even when we've had a great conversation with someone and we could have ended a, a actual sales meeting with them saying wow i'm so interested follow up with me in a couple of weeks right and um and then you say okay and a couple of weeks later you're sending those emails that say just following up you know <laughs> me again sorry to bother you so all of those things those those are all phrases that that i refer to as tells and so if you, let me just fix my screen here. Sorry about that. Um, if you think about a tell, um, so my husband, my husband's a poker player. I should share that. My husband's a poker player. 
And uh, we go to Vegas and I don't gamble that much, but I find it very interesting to kind of look at look at it. And uh, so in poker, you have these tells, these little things that you do that you may not even realize you're doing, and yet they betray what you have in your hand. They may even betray a lack of confidence in your hand. And so salespeople have tells. And one of my favorite things to do is to diagnose the tells. And so for example, that phrase, I'm just following up, that's a tell that says you don't really feel comfortable reaching out. You don't really feel that you've earned the right, even just the word just. So we're gonna talk about more tells. But first, let me break down mindset into kind of three things that you can do just to give you something more, more tactical to, to kind of do to look at, you know, is this something that we can, we can address in our organization? So the first is what you probably assume when I say mindset, mindset to begin with um, is your own mindset, your own programming. What are your core values? What are those beliefs or potentially the head trash around either selling in general or reaching out to the specific people that you're reaching out to? Um, a lot of salespeople who are trying to reach an executive level um, have what we call imposter syndrome, where they really feel like it's like they're asking that executive for a favor of their time. When really, if you look at step two in mindset, it's about internalizing the deep value and the mission of your business. And one of the exercises that's really um, fun to do actually in, in your teams, for those of you, I know we have several people who are joining this conference as a team, you know, sit down and really think about what is our mission in our own words? What, what emotions does it convey to us? What does it make our, the people we work with feel? And it's not just like the words on your website that says our mission, our vision, our, you know, our three pillars. It's really when you think about what you do, why is it so important? You know, it's the why behind the business and internalize that to a level that you feel that everyone you talk to, you're like saving their life. You're, you're solving problems for them. You are the knight in shining armor, you're the hero to come in and save the day. And you know exactly why what you do is so important, why you're uniquely qualified to do this work and why it's so important to do it now. You know, what is going to create urgency for them? So that's the second part. So the first part of mindset is your mindset, sort of a deep dive into your own stuff. The second one is a deep dive into the mission of the business and internalizing the, the real value of the business. And then the third thing is internalizing and doing a deep dive into the psychographic of your ideal bullseye target customer. And what I mean by that, you know, in general terms, it's psychographic. Um, for those of you in marketing, it's something you probably work with. Um, thinking about sort of emotions and behaviors and even personality traits and, and motivators. And, to, to make it even easier than that, it's just thinking about the people you're calling as actual people. <laughs> they are real people with real lives and their own stress and their own schedules and their families and everything that they're dealing with. And, and you're constantly trying to insert yourself into that. It's interesting because a lot of times when I start working with, with clients and we do this sort of initial diagnostic and I ask, who is your ideal bullseye target customer? They'll describe the company. They'll say, well, we work with, you know, bio, bio uh, tech companies about this size and they have these problems and they really focus on sort of the company as the target. The thing is, you don't sell to companies, even if you're doing B2B sales. Obviously, if you're selling to consumers, you, you know this as well, right? So you're selling to people no matter what your business model is. And one exercise you can do, and again, this is a fun team activity, is to spend a day in the life of your ideal customer. You know, visualize for yourself from the time they wake up in the morning. First of all, what time do they wake up? Are they early risers? Are these people who are getting up at 5 a.m. and they're going to the gym and they're highly motivated, uh, very driven? Um, or are they people that are just struggling to get by in a day? And they're trying to figure out, you know, how to survive and balance it all. And they're juggling and the kids are yelling at them and the dog's barking and sort of picture what their life is like before they get to work. Just that exercise alone, it puts you into a totally different 
um, mindset around who you're calling and, and how you're going to best reach them. And then more logistically, as you kind of work through their day, you can start to picture, you know, when are they likely to be at their desk and, and not in a meeting? You know, when are they likely to be what we call hangry? <laughs> Where's that time of the day where you know it's past lunch and they still haven't eaten lunch yet? I'm guessing that's not the best time to call. And, and just having this kind of, you know, customized way of looking at the people you're calling helps you be more effective. Because the alternative is to try to use, for example, data that says the best time to call someone is at 2 p.m. on Tuesday. Well, guess what? I'm never calling someone <laughs> because I know that now that's out there. Again, to Ryan's point, we've had all this data out there for years and years. That's the time when everyone's calling and emailing. So I'm going to instead try to make it much more targeted towards sort of that experience of life that my, my prospect is living and try to cater to, to them. So those are the three sort of mindset things to kind of look at your own mindset, the, my, the sort of internalize the mission and the value and kind of feel that of, of your business and your value proposition. And then also really thinking about the people you're selling to, because ultimately, you know, that is what it's all about. And I know for me, part of the reason why I started to think about sales in a different way and create this methodology was I had been to so much sales training where I knew what they were telling me was good advice. You know, the scripts they were giving me, say this, don't say that. You know, we had um, a lot of Mad Libs where it was like, dear customer, are you dealing with fill in the blank? <laughs> and I just never could do it. I'm like, you know what? I would rather just have a real conversation with someone and get to know them than try to feel like I'm trying to fit myself into a script that probably isn't gonna feel natural to me. And as a result, I'm going to end up feeling uncomfortable and it's going to feed all my own head trash about what selling is, you know? So, so really it's about getting to a place where you feel really comfortable. That said, the message is also really important. And so we look at the message. The first thing is to audit for those things that give away your tells. So I mentioned the first, um, I mentioned the first one, um, the just following up. The other one, which is so common and is so revealing, is the sorry to bother you, right? Or even if you're not saying that, but in your own mind, you're holding back from doing the amount of follow-up you need to do or from making that phone call that you, you promised you were going to make, because in your own mind, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to be a pest. I don't want to bother them. They might think I'm too aggressive or they might think I'm annoying, right? I don't know about, about you, but I hear that a lot. So you'll have to let me know if that is if that is head trash that you share. Um, if it is, then it goes back to, you know, why do you believe that? What is it about what you're trying to share that, they, that you don't believe they need, right? Because when you truly deeply believe in the value of what you're selling, when you believe that you can help someone, or even just you believe that there's value in connecting and having a, a, a conversation, then you're never bugging anyone. Certainly at the beginning of the sales cycle. So if we go to like, let's say those people that they're not only, they haven't fallen in the black hole, you've just never gotten them. <laughs> they're just floating out into space because you've never been able to actually get them. And, and so starting with that, you know, what is the message to even get them into your sphere? You know, what is the, the message to get them to come visit your your product planet. Um, and, and the key to that, and, and actually throughout the whole sales cycle, if we then transition even to the methods and the process, is to focus on your goal. Think about why you are trying to reach them. Why are you sending that LinkedIn message? Why are you sending that, that initial email or leaving that initial voicemail? It is not to sell. And if it is, then I would really reassess your goal. Because we know based on data that I mentioned before, that it does take multiple touches, lots of different types of connections in order to, to get someone to talk to you and then to eventually close the deal. It's very unusual that you're gonna tell someone what you do and they're gonna say, yes, sign me up. And if you're in that business, that's a transactional model that a lot of this you probably don't even need, right? If you're in the order taking business and that's your, your choice, uh, that's a different kind of a business model than what we're talking about here. Most of the businesses we're talking about, they don't have that model. And some of them may have that model and they're trying to get out of it, 
right? They may be viewed to their customers or some of their customers as a vendor or a supplier, and they actually are trying to take that up a notch to be a partner and to build a relationship and have a more strategic, higher level kind of a relationship where they can become a trusted advisor and thereby end up doing more business and and just having a better working relationship and a longer term, more sustainable relationship. So if you don't want to be transactional, then don't sell the first time you reach out to someone. Your initial message, again, with that really clear mindset that right now, all I want to do is figure out if there's even a good mutual connection here, right? Because it's not just about you convincing them to work with you or you educating them about who you are. And it's not even just about you learning about them so you can sell to them. It may be that they're just not a good fit for you. They may not be your ideal bullseye client. They may not be, you know, you may not be a good fit for each other. It's like I always tell, I have a teenage daughter and I'm always telling her, you know, when you meet someone, you have to make sure that, that, that they're right for you and you're right for them. Because sometimes you meet people and you're right for them and they're not right for you or vice versa. So we're looking for a good mutual fit. Those words, just thinking about the message to give you a good kind of uh, phrase to use, um, a good mutual fit, that is a great goal to articulate to, you know, to someone you're reaching out to. And in the beginning, what I advise is just get the conversation. When you reach out that first time, it should just be an ask for a conversation so you can learn more about them. And you're going to use some of the great questions that Ryan had for you. You're going to learn about them. You're certainly happy to answer any questions they have for you. And then you'll mutually decide on next steps, if any, right? Take the pressure way off, actually sell less, and eventually you will sell more. So sell less in the beginning, it'll help you sell more down the line. And then once you get that great conversation, that's where, you know what, it just lead with your presence. A lot of people tell me, a lot of salespeople, particularly newer salespeople or owners or founders of business that don't consider themselves natural salespeople, they say, well, I, I get nervous to reach out because I don't know what to say. You know, I, what if we get, what if they answer the phone? What will I say? Right? It's really not about having all the answers. It's not about, you know, sparkling them with like how brilliant your solution is and how great you are and saying the exact right slick thing that you're going to say. It's really about asking those really good questions, leading with curiosity and being genuinely interested and leading with this presence and with going back to mindset that that deep conviction that you love what you do and you want to share it without you saying anything or regardless of what you say, even if you mess up a little bit, If you have that energy, people will remember that feeling. They will remember that energy. And if you can then also connect to their energy and their emotions and what they're experiencing and their presence and look below the words or look behind the words, that is going to make you so much more successful. Because what we know to be true is that people buy based on emotion and then they justify with facts and logic. That's why sending those emails with lots of facts and figures and those attachments and links and all of that stuff doesn't work at all. And also voice and a live conversation will always be more effective than email. And it's interesting because I'll often work with companies at a stage where they don't have their marketing 100% buttoned up or, or maybe they have a new product that isn't, you know, the marketing isn't quite ready or then, you know, just for whatever reason, Sort of the sales side doesn't think the marketing side is is quite up to snuff. And there's a lot of that that internal tension at the intersection of sales and marketing. And the reality is, if you're in sales, you are a salesperson and you are connecting with another person. The other stuff is almost ancillary. You know, it's really kind of amazing when when you can just bring it to that that connected level and find out what really is going to motivate someone and how you can solve their problems. If anything, at that point, if you sent them a slick one pager, you know, I don't know. I feel like that wouldn't even give you as much of a leg up as as a really thoughtful email that broke down exactly what they said and then mapped it to exactly what what you said. And I know that Keenan, the sales guy, is going to be on later. Um, and also to to sort of reinforce something I know he's going to talk a lot about. It's really about 
as um, as was mentioned in my my intro, taking it from being transactional to transformational. And the transformation is where are they today and where do they want to be? And I'm going to give you um, four ways that you can help them measure that impact. So when you are having that conversation, when you're sharing that message, um, think about this acronym HERD, H-E-R-D. So if you're taking notes, write down H-E-R-D. The H stands for hours, right? We can always quantify in time. And it's not just the time you're saving them. It's also the time that they're, they're spending thinking about it and talking about it and trying to solve it. It's not just about efficiency. The E is for emotions. And this is, to, in my mind, the most underutilized sales tool out there because we're always trying to figure out like, how do, we, how do we do it better? How do we have a better process? How do we say things that are better? This is the key is getting to that emotion. Uh, there's actually a great book um, by Chris Voss, V-O-S-S, called Never Split the Difference. And I don't know if there's going to be notes somewhere in the, in the chat, maybe somebody can write that out for everyone. It's Never Bit Split the Difference. And he talks, Chris Voss talks a lot about emotional mirroring. And I love it because what that allows you to do is sort of be almost like a little bit of a detective. Um, Chris was a hostage negotiator for the FBI. So we're not, you know, saving lives here for the most part. Uh, and still we want to negotiate as if our life depended on it, to use Chris's words. And, uh, and so what I would say, just to kind of bring that to this conversation, uh, is look for the emotion. When someone says to you, oh, so frustrating when X, Y, Z happens, say like, wow, yeah, I, I, could, I could feel your frustration. Tell me, tell me more about that. What specifically is frustrating to you, right? When they say words like overwhelmed, anxious, afraid, you know, whatever it might be, anchor those emotions and dig in. Don't be afraid to... To, to, to bring that out more. And sometimes silence can do the heavy lifting, particularly if you're in a live conversation and you see someone experiencing an emotion, give them space. Don't try to fill that space with, you know, try to save them from themselves. And, and that connection, that, that listening and that empathy will do huge things for the relationship and will make an impact in the sale. Because ultimately, when you get to building your proposal and having your great solution that is technically sound and, and shows your, your client satisfaction and the success and all of those things that, that make you indeed the perfect candidate for them or the perfect solution for them, they will also consider all of that, but they'll trust their gut. They have a good gut feeling about you. Sometimes and very often, uh, that will actually trump the other things. And to give you a good example of this, when I, I left, I was at a company called Gartner for like 11 years, and I, I left Gartner to, to go to a startup and, um, and just to really help get a startup off the ground where we really had no customers at first and no product and we were creating everything. And we were creating a solution that directly competed with a much larger, very well-established company. And uh, I remember sitting in my first kind of big deal meeting, like multi-million dollar meeting at a boardroom table full of all these execs looking at me and asking me all these questions. And, and really at the core of what I was trying to convince them is, is that they had problems they didn't even know they had. And that not only could we solve the problems that they knew they had, we could also do all these other things. And more than that, I had a team of people and myself that felt so passionately about this and felt passionately about partnering with them and connecting with them. And throughout the whole conversation, we were very mindful of really tuning into those emotional keywords, really tuning into what level of frustration they were having with their current solution, um, what they were hoping to achieve, what was the culture they were trying to create, all those things that were beneath the surface of the actual conversation. And by tapping into those, we ultimately got the business. And we got the business away from someone who had multi-million dollars worth of marketing out there. They had many more existing clients than we had. And, and really, at, as we continued to work with them, they said it was because they trusted us, because they felt that it wasn't just a 
check the box, get another client, make them happy kind of a thing. It was like a, it was like that life and death kind of feeling that we had and that deep passion for what we did. And more importantly, they knew we actually cared. They knew that we cared because we kept showing them and picking up on all the things that they were saying throughout the conversation. So the takeaway from that is, you know, lead with your presence and your words will follow. But the presence and the energy and the emotion is the most important thing when you're when you're connecting with that message and slowing down the sales process so that in the beginning, you know exactly what your goal is, right? Which is to get that first conversation. Once you have that conversation, going back to what I said at the very beginning, you could still lose. <laughs> so first of all, what Ryan said about you doing less talking than the client is absolutely on point. And one of the great tools that I love to give people is, when you're in the conversation with a client, first of all, when they are talking, you're winning. When you're talking, you could be losing. And ideally, either way, you want them to be doing more of the talking. So the, the tool to use is to write the letters or write the word WAIT, W-A-I-T. So write that somewhere on your computer or, or in your notebook when you're in that meeting. And when you catch yourself saying too much, and going into fix it mode, or just rattling on about your solution and how great it is, or whatever it might be, look at the word wait, and it stands for why am I talking? <laughs> right? Give yourself that cue and just like zip it and let them and, and let them talk. And just you could even just stop yourself and say, I'm, so go back to what you said about XYZ. Tell me more about that. Let's dig into that a little bit right? So that piece of it is so important. <clears throat> Once you have that first meeting, when we think about now we've got, we're in the right mindset, we're thinking about all the things, we're really trying to solve their, their problems, we're connecting with them, bringing out the emotion. And then um, we think about sort of the process, right? So now we have them in the meeting and they say, this sounds great. I'm very interested. Definitely follow up with me in, in two weeks. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. The number one reason why prospects go into the black hole is we let them. We believe them when they say, follow up with me, and I'm definitely interested. It's such a travesty, but actually, the, it's most common and most painful to lose prospects into the black hole who are your best potential clients. They're in the pipeline. You've put them into your fabulous CRM as a 90 percenter, right? Because you're so convinced that you, you've made this con connection and perhaps you have. And yet we let them go. Instead, I want you to have you know, somewhere again on your on your desk, you know, something to get yourself to remember that you will always get the next meeting. Always, always, always get the next meeting unless there's nothing to talk about and you're not interested in doing business with them. You've established it's not a good fit. That's okay too. Sometimes closing for no is just as valuable as closing for yes. I would rather close a conversation with a mutual agreement that it doesn't make sense for us to work together. And that's maybe our last conversation or if we see each other around, that's great. We'll follow up. We'll let you know, keep in touch. That's okay if you've decided that this has closed for now. If it is someone you want to do business with, then you want to get the next meeting. Mutually agreed next step. And whatever that may be. Ideally, the process, the sales cycle is first meeting, proposal meeting, close. Wouldn't that be great? I don't know about you, but most of the sales I've been involved with had a much longer sales cycle with different meetings that had to happen in between discovery, you know, internal conversations, decision by committee. So it required multiple meetings. So what I want to do is create a lifeline from one meeting to the next. It is the tether that keeps them out of the black hole. So it would look like this before the end of the meeting and you recap, say, this sounds great. It sounds like uh, you've said you have um, an internal discussion you have to have. We're going to get you a few more details. And then um, in, and then you mentioned we should follow up in two weeks. And they say, yes, yeah, say, great. OK, so two weeks, that puts us like March 12th. Does that, does that work for you? And, and most of the, I've hardly had anyone say, absolutely not. I'm never meeting with you again. I said two weeks. What are you doing, right? And yet the head trash, go back to mindset as always, the head trash says, 
I don't want to scare them away, right? I don't want to be too aggressive. I don't want to be, I don't want them to think I'm being pushy. Well, guess what? Again, if you believe that there is a good mutual fit here, there's a way that you can really help them. You are creating urgency. You are keeping them engaged. You are creating momentum for them. It is not for you to make the sale. It is so that you can help them and you can make sure that you have those connecting points in that lifeline. So you would propose that day and time that they would meet and you can back into it with as much finesse as you feel comfortable. For me, I'm usually, I usually say something like, all right, two weeks that puts us around May, or sorry, March, you know, March 12th. Is this usually a good time around now? And they say, yes, great. I'll send you a meeting invite. And, uh, and again, to, and I'll confirm the action items we discussed. And then I look forward to, to speaking with you. I'm so excited to, to do this. I really am so confident that this is going to be exactly what you need or something along those lines and end on an emotional kind of a high note, right? And then you send them the invite, you confirm the next steps, and each stage just goes like that. No matter what they say, you make sure you get that next meeting. The other best practice with that is if they give you a timeline, let's say they say, well, we're going to need at least a month, follow us, let's let's follow up with me in a month. I say, great, okay, so I'm happy to do that. Well, we can schedule time in April or May or whatever the month is. And, um, and in the meantime, I'm curious, uh, help me understand what, what has to happen between now and then. So walk me through your process and, and let's make sure that you have everything you need to have the internal discussions or whatever whatever has to happen on your end. And again, your understanding of their process, your understanding of what's happening between now and the next time you meet, it is for them. It is for you to make sure that, that they have everything they need, that you're working with them as a trusted partner, uh, and that you're both in lockstep. So that's really kind of the key, you know, the key part there in terms of making sure that that you are connecting the dots and getting the next meeting. I also want to give you, let me grab this one thing over here. I also want to give you kind of just four, um, I guess, principles to follow. Because again, you know, I'm giving you some talk tracks and I'm and I'm and I'm letting you know some some ways to handle it. And yet I feel like if you have things you can just sort of latch on to. Uh, to, to keep in mind as you're going through your, your day, it, it just makes it so much easier. And again, what I want to do is, is help, help you in this process, not only just have like a tactic to use, but have a way to internalize it, let it settle into your mindset and have it be something that just becomes part of your everyday existence. So the first thing is being clear on your goal and knowing what you're trying to accomplish at each step. So we talked about that. Again, that's making sure that if you're sending that LinkedIn message, if your goal is not to sell, then don't send them the three paragraphs about your business and why you're so great and the testimonials and all of that. Um, it's interesting, I actually started a section on my website called the email cemetery. And then the headline is, this is where bad sales emails come to die. <laughs> and most of them come from LinkedIn. And I know you guys know what I'm talking about. Is when someone links into you and then they send you that really long message. And at the end of it, you don't even know. It's just so much information that either you just decided that, again, fight or flight response, I am not even going to engage this person because if this is their first email, I can just imagine what the rest is going to be. In that, too, again, connecting the mindset and, and having that clear goal with the message, if your goal is to have a meaningful conversation, then Ask for the amount of time it will take to get to a meaningful conversation. One of my big pet peeves is the 15 minute ask. <laughs> when someone sends me a big long email and then they say, oh, and I really wanna learn about you, would you give me 15 minutes or could we schedule a 15 minute call? And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, they don't really wanna know that much about me if they're only gonna give me 15 minutes. <laughs> and that's really not the basis for starting a good relationship. So think about, you know, what is your what is your real ask? What is the goal and how much time do you actually need? And make sure that it is super clear. You know, and and if it's and if your goal is not to sell, then just, you know, back off and let them know that. Just say, "Hey, at this point, there may or may not be a good mutual fit. My goal is really to 
to learn more about you, answer some questions that you may have about me, and then we can mutually decide on next steps, if any. The second part, um, or the second kind of principle, is, is to lead with that presence. Lead with confidence, lead with curiosity, and lead with caring. And I think that, that that warmth and that personality to kind of bring that out in your in yourself is one of the best gifts that you can give yourself. And spending time on, on connecting with, you know, what is it about your business that you love? And uh, earlier, I think it was Ryan who was talking about questions you can ask. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask anyone, in, particularly in a networking environment um, or an environment where, you know, you don't necessarily want to say, so what do you do? Right. When I or maybe that's the first question and they've said something about their, you know, their role and their company. My real favorite question to ask is, what do you love about what you do? What's your favorite thing about what you do? You know, why do you love it? Another one or another version of that is to ask yourself and to ask your, your customer or your prospect or your person you're meeting at a networking event. Uh, it's based on this Howard Thurman quote, which is, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and do more of that. Because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. So I love this question, what makes you come alive? So even if you're not talking about work, you're not, you want to take it away from just connecting about the company and the product and the problems and solutions, you know, that's a, a great question to connect with someone where you, it may not be appropriate to say, oh, do you have kids? Are you married? You know, some of those questions, which may or may not, you know, be appropriate for how the relationship has progressed to that point. When you just ask someone, what makes you come alive? Like, what's that thing that when you talk about, you just light up, right? And, and in some cases, I hope, in a lot of cases, it might lead to them talking about what they do professionally. And if not, you'll get insight into what makes them come alive personally, and perhaps, you know, the, the sports they love or the things they love to do with their kids. And then the next question is why? You know, what about it do you love? They say, oh, I love, you know, when I play hockey, I come alive. What is it? You know, tell me more about that. What, what is it about uh, the sport that really, you know, makes you come alive that, that you love? And, and see, do they say it's big because it's fast paced, because it has a lot of adrenaline, because there's an element of danger, you know, there are going to be things that are going to reveal reveal themselves to you that you won't get any other way. So I love that that question, what makes you come alive? And in general, again, go back to leading with curiosity. And when you do that, if you have any head trash about selling or making calls or going to events or or anything along those lines, just remember that you don't have to have all the answers. You do have to be prepared with the right questions. And you do want to come and put your best foot forward in terms of just really being interested instead of interesting, right? So that's an, that's an old um, common phrase these days, but take that to heart, you know, be interesting, sorry, be interested, not interesting. And, and when you're interested, when you're truly curious, people feel that. There's an expression that being listened to feels so much like love, you might not know the difference, right? And it's just that kind of like, oh, tell me more, right? And it comes from the more authentic place it comes from, the better. And the third thing is that confidence in your mission, understanding very clearly what is that heard impact. So how do you help your, your clients with their hours, their emotions, their relationships, and their dollars? And actually, I'm just thinking, I might not have gotten to the last two, two initials of that. So earlier, I mentioned heard, and I don't think I finished that, that, that thought. So it was hours, emotions. That was H-E. The R was relationships. So the so understanding the impact of relationships, both internally and externally. So for many companies, the work that they're doing, you know, you may be connecting it to um, to you know them working with their customers, and there's often also an impact internally in terms of the way that their employees feel about working for their company. It can connect to the kind of culture they're trying to they're trying to foster. And if you work with particularly founders, CEOs, people in very high stress, higher level jobs, or people in general that, that you know have very busy roles um, and are under a lot of stress, um, often 
you'll uncover through thinking of them and their sort of day in the life that they often translate that stress to home and that it has an effect on their home life. And maybe they don't see their kids as much as they want to. Maybe they're working weekends. Maybe they haven't taken a vacation. Whatever that impact is, it's affecting their, their relationships. So that was the, the, the R in herd. So it's hours, emotions, relationships. And then the D, which is often what most people will go to because they think of return on investment as dollars. And so that is also really valid and really valuable. So when you can quantify in dollars what they are hoping to achieve or what you could help them save, that's where you really get to being able to create true value. Because when you're talking about where they are today and where they want to be, and you can really articulate the value of that difference, that is what they pay you for. And I know that that's going to be spoken about a lot more later on. And if you can kind of have that conversation, sort of think about that internally and sort of get your own team, if you're part of a team or if you're an entrepreneur, have that meeting with yourself, um, then, you know, ask your, you know, ask everyone to really articulate what are all the ways that we help people save time? What are all the ways that we help and connect to the emotions and, and make their lives better from an emotional standpoint or that we can, you know, address the pain that they're experiencing? What are all the ways that we can connect to the relationships that they're in and, and help make all of those relationships better? And then also, what's all the ways we could save them money? And thinking about their return on investment in multiple dimensions. So that's kind of step three. And then the last one is really about being consistent and remembering that small things done are always going to be better than great things planned. I actually had a call this morning with someone who said, yeah, I know I've had the last two weeks, you know, he's the president of the company also selling. And he said, yes, I've been so busy the last two weeks. I just haven't had time to, to do the sales thing. Right. And I know many of you can relate to this, that that prospecting, that proactive selling can fall by the wayside when you are also doing client delivery and also have other responsibilities within your organization. And even for people who have sales as their dedicated job, I think they still sometimes struggle um, with time management and figuring out how to balance all of the things that they have to do. And really what it is, and even thinking about putting notes in the CRM, for example, right? So the best thing to do is in the moment when you have that client on the phone in that moment when you're, um, when you're sending that email, and now we have the technology. And obviously, Nutshell is a great example of that, that it's designed to make your life easier, right? And aside from that, it's just carving out those small chunks of time. One of the biggest mistakes I think people make, and again, this goes back to their mindset, which is it's kind of like working out. They say, well, in order to work out <laughs> or in order to make a bunch of outbound sales calls, I have to carve out two hours on my calendar. I have to be like, I have to set myself up. I have to do the research. I have to... Right. They have this whole thing like mapped out in their head and it becomes this big project, right? That's going to be done someday. Or they put it on their calendar and then somehow things seem to get in the way. Instead, what I would suggest is carve out smaller bits of time every single day in a couple of in a couple of chunks and a couple of smaller time slots. And if you are organized, if you're using your tools like your CRM then you know what you need to do and you don't need to overthink it. You know what your goal is. You know who you have to call. You know where they are in the sales cycle. So just reach out to them. Pick up the phone. <laughs> Leave an easy message. And the message should not be more than a couple of sentences because you either have a relationship with them or you're trying to get a first conversation where you will find out what you need to find out. Okay, and there's different best practices around that if we think about, again, method and, and the right cadence of calls versus emails. In many cases, it's helpful to leave a voicemail, leave your number and let them know you're going to either email them with with a meeting request and kind of leave it at that. Don't take lots of time for them to listen to you on the phone because they probably are answering or listening to their voicemails when they're in the middle of a lot of other things. Either way, um, keep it simple. And, and have that clear intention of what you're trying to do. 
there's a great story and I think we're, we're getting ready to wrap up, but there's, uh, I love Zen parables. And there's a great story about uh, a man who's riding this horse and he's galloping through town at a million miles an hour and is flying everywhere. And he's got a long cape blowing in the wind and, and clearly going somewhere very important. <laughs> and someone in the village yells out to him, hey, where are you going? And the man says, I have no idea, ask the horse. <laughs> So don't be that guy. <laughs> be the one that is in control of your own destiny. And most importantly, I would say, really enjoy the ride. And I don't know if there are any questions on the line. I'm happy to take them if there are. And anyone is welcome to connect with me uh, as well. I'm, I'm everywhere online as Charlene Ignites. I'm easy to find. And I'm always happy to have a conversation with you and, and again, answer questions and help uh, in a way, any way that I can. So let's see if there's any questions. Right, thank you so much, Charlene. That was such an inspiring talk. Um, I think we can all agree that the world needs more of what makes you come alive. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Uh, you do have a moment for a few questions? Sure. Great. Okay, well, we loved how you spoke about finding good mutual fits in business um, through genuine question asking. Um, what would be your tips on how to break up with a bad mutual fit? Yeah, I think, you know, setting boundaries is always a difficult thing. I think one is having a lot of clarity. Um, one of my favorite expressions is clarity is power. Clarity is power. Mm -hmm. And so when you can articulate, you know, what what it is, then that's going to make things um, a lot easier. And And you can have what we call a fierce conversation. And tactically, the way to approach that is to, one, first identify the mutual goal. So most likely, if you want to break up with them, you're at odds with what your goal is. So you want to identify that, have some facts or some some emotion and things to sort of back that up, which is sort of the reality of the situation, um, and then suggest the way forward. So it's not just a breakup. It's ideally you're giving, you're still helping them. You just may be helping point them in a different direction. So for me, if I ever stop working with a client or I ever meet someone who's not a good fit, what I want to do is suggest someone who might be able to help them or, or point them in a direction that that uh, I believe they'll still get what they need, even if it's not me. <laughs> That's excellent advice. Thank you so much. Um, and then one more. You mentioned Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference. Uh, we'd love to know what else is on your reading list. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. You know, it's really interesting. One of, you know, I really love, um, I love it when business builders write and blog. I'm a big fan of blogging and, and I know I've written some stuff and helped um, Ben with some of the nutshell uh, blogs or contributed, I should say. And so I actually really recommend reading fiction. You know, uh, let your let your brain explore, let your brain imagine. And um, so I, I do. I read a lot of sort of fantasy um, and historical fiction and and just great writing. And I feel like yeah. when you read uh, when you read great books that are just so well written, you become a much better writer. And it's very motivating from a writing perspective. Wow. What a great answer. We're all feeling super inspired over here at uh nutshell hq i thank you so much for your time today charlene we really really appreciate you joining us for our first boundless event uh thank you so much my pleasure thanks for having me take care absolutely you too.